So uh, Dr. Brenda Moran is one of the joint leads at the um, recently opened or soon to be opened Complex Menopause Clinic at CUMH. She's an accredited um, menopause person with the British Menopause Society. She's a portfolio GP with a special interest in women's health. So Brenda, look, delighted to chat with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Lovely to chat with you today, Sinead. Okay, fantastic. So I suppose, look, we'll we'll dive into it, as the fellow says. Um, in terms of the complex menopause clinics around the country, and I know we have some open and there's more due to open, can you give us a sense, um, Brenda, of what is the criteria or the eligibility for a person to get a referral to a complex menopause clinic? Yeah, so Dr. Deirdre Lundy had the unenviable task of, of setting the, the criteria initially when the first complex menopause clinic opened the National Maternity Hospital almost two years ago now. And how these complex menopause clinics came to, to come into, um, to be established really is, is from funding that was made available by the Women's Health Action Plan um, from, um, from 2021-2022, which I suppose recognised that menopause is an area of need and that there was a need for publicly funded clinics to support people that can sometimes have some medical conditions whereby menopause or treating menopause can sometimes be a little bit more challenging um, right. compared to not having some of these medical conditions. Yeah. So uh, it is not an exhaustive list. That's the first thing to say. Okay. Um, but in general, the the criteria, um, the the it would be confined to people that would have a uh, active indication to HRT or perceived historical contraindication to HRT, such as um, breast cancer, hormone sensitive cancers, other types of cancers as well, depending on, on the type, um, a history of a heart attack or a stroke or a clot, mm -hmm. active liver disease, some immunological conditions, whereby there might be concerns with some interactions with other medications or people that might have a lot of medical comorbidities after yeah, um, like a lot of kidney disease or after transplants. Um, and also, I suppose in Dublin, people are lucky that there is an established um, clinic for premature ovarian insufficiency, which is menopause under the age of 40. But we don't have that in other areas of, of the country. So the complex right, menopause right. clinics will also cater for um, POI or for women who have an, uh, menopause under the age of 40 in these clinics as well. OK, it's not exhaustive. You know, some, some people might wonder if, if, they're, if they meet their criteria, and it's always worth having that conversation with your GP who can always discuss it with, with the individual clinics. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's worth making the point, although I think most people would probably know this, but you will make the point anyway for the sake of clarity. You can't just rock up to the complex menopause clinic. You must get a referral from your GP. Is that correct, Brenda? Yeah, and, and that would be the case with, with the vast majority of, of, of hospital-based outpatient clinics. Yeah, okay. so it would be a, a referral from, from a GP. Now, sometimes this, the um, you know secondary care referrals will be accepted as well. So from breast clinics and from um, the specialist uh, nurses that might work in the area of cancer or in heart disease and yes. it's not just it's but the majority of referrals would come in via the GP. Yeah and when I was speaking to your colleague uh, Dr Karen Soff a couple of weeks ago we we very briefly because we don't want to be too negative obviously we don't be negative at all but we we touched on 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 the subject of waiting lists and all of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. I've no doubt that things are going to be extremely busy for you down at CUMH at the Complex Menopause Clinic. How is that looking in terms of waiting lists or do you have any sense of that at this stage? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's just being established. We are right. still even in the process of finalising their criteria um, with CUMH to be sent out to the GPs. But we've had a, a couple of referrals through already before the criteria have been sent out because people are aware that it's about to be established. So we have started to see patients um, just kind of about two weeks ago now so we're okay we're up and running slowly but we still have things to I, I guess um finalize yeah but yes, it is good to be up and running um the south southwest hospital group or the south I, I guess you know that encompasses Cork Kerry parts of Waterford well, Waterford at the moment and parts of Tipperary right um so it's a large large area um so you, you know at the moment we, we only have funding from National Women's and Infants Health Programme for, let's say, one uh, clinic a week. Um, so hopefully in time, once there, it's established that there's a need for this area, which I imagine that there is. Indeed. Funding can increase. Okay, fantastic. 
So um, I suppose um, I'm going to make an assumption here and forgive me, everybody who's watching this, if if this is is not a correct one. But I, I think when people think about complex menopause or certainly when I used to think about it, um, Brenda, people think about, you know, HRT and cancer. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. oh, you know, and again, general broad stroke stuff like, oh, well, if you've had cancer, you can't have you can't have HRT. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it's 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 definitely more nuanced than that. And there's no certainties in, in any not. aspect of, of, of medicine. Course. But, you know, everybody's going to have an individual menopause like Karen was discussing. And some people will have very mild symptoms. Other people, at least one in four, will have very troublesome symptoms. Yeah. And that can impact on the quality of life. So is on the table. They can decide how they want to navigate their menopause and their perimenopause, be that be just lifestyle alone, be that psychological therapies, complementary therapies, HRT. For some people, um, every option isn't always on the table or we don't have a lot of information or, or data looking at HRT in certain conditions. And that's why it's just a little bit more trickier in some of these conditions um, that we see in the complex menopause clinics. Now, that doesn't mean that it's it's a blanket no for HRT for, you know, for every single condition or even for every single cancer, including breast cancer. But every I suppose it, it gives the everything would need to be discussed um, in terms of the benefits and the risks of using HRT uh, to see whether it would be the right fit for that individual person. OK, fantastic. That's great to know. And what about um, localized estrogen? So I'm a big fan of Vagifem Fem myself. <laughs> I was yeah. um, uh, it was it was I, I, I'm, I'm like sharing everything about my medical records and my life now on the Internet. Don't even care. Um, so I was prescribed with Vagifem. Fem. Oh, my God. A number of months ago or whatever. Um, so what about the likes of a localized estrogen like that? And and um, in a complex case. And again, bearing in mind, everybody's an individual, Brenda. But generally speaking, if one yes. can speak generally. Yeah. Yeah. So for the vast majority of people, localized estrogen is easy to use and atrophy, discharge, um, overactive bladder for some people that might be attributable to low estrogen levels or what we call genital urinary syndrome of the menopause in medical circles. That isn't reversible. So unlike the majority of menopausal symptoms, which will improve for the vast majority of people as they navigate premenopause and become postmenopausal after a couple of years, they resolve. Unfortunately, GSM, as we say, genital urinary syndrome of the menopause doesn't improve. And it it is a lifelong condition that needs to be treated. And you're writing that wasn't recognized. um, And for a long time and that people were kind of recommended a short course of treatment. Um, but now it's kind of, more, you know, rec- we should be giving it to people long term. Okay. Um, the vast majority of people can take it safely. Right. Um, it's usually um, there's different types. So it's a it consists of a very, very, very small amount of estrogen, which can be delivered into the vagina, which you can usually by yourself as a pessary or a cream or a gel or even a little ring. Mm. Um and it acts locally in the vaginal tissues and and the surrounding structures, kind of sometimes some of the, the muscle areas around it and then the bladder. Um, and it doesn't enter the bloodstream or the amount that enters the bloodstream would be negligible. It can be a little bit at the very, very start when it, the, 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 the tissues in the vagina might be very, very thin. But yeah. as that re- regenerates and becomes much plumper when you're giving vaginal estrogen, you know, it doesn't enter the bloodstream any, anymore. So, um so people that we would have might have had concerns about in the past, um, the, the heart attacks, the 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 clots, the the strokes, all those people with vascular risk factors can use it very safely. In breast cancer, the 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 guidelines would still be to go for non-hormonal first line, so the vaginal moisturizers and lubricants. Um, but if you're still struggling after that, which a lot of people will, it's still it's very much recognized as a second line option for women with with breast cancer or hormone sensitive ca- cancers there's just a little bit of um caution still with in terms of aromatase inhibitors um the british menopause society guidelines still recommend not using it with aromatase inhibitors whereas the north american society guidelines and can i can i ask you can. Brenda, what what are what what inhibitors there that you're talking about <laughs> sorry i was i was <laughs> running, running away myself. Aromatase and paper doses would be the, one of the adjuvant therapies that it would be used for women um, that have a hormone sensitive breast cancer 
okay. when they're postmenopausal. So it it acts by inhibiting this kind of little enzyme in fat cells, which can produce estrogen in, in, in the cells or a form of estrogen. So it kind of suppresses that. So okay. there's still a little bit of controversy when it comes to vaginal estrogen with aromatase inhibitors, but we'll hopefully know more about that in due course of the next, um, you know, quite soon, really, over the next year or two, I'd imagine. And it's still a, not an absolute no, but it would need to be discussed with the oncology doctors. Of course, absolutely. And then as well, um, I came to realise or learned recently because this whole experience of putting the National Menopause Summit together has been a wonderful learning experience for me, working with yourself and all our speakers in Cork and then our previous speakers in Dublin. Honestly, it, it literally, I, I refer to it as a masterclass for, for our delegates, but I have absolutely had a masterclass in menopause myself, uh, uh, you know, getting to know all the speakers and all of that kind of stuff, even in terms of breast cancer. Brenda and tell me if I'm correct or wrong here even in terms of breast cancer there are in fact different types of breast cancer isn't is, isn't that correct and there may even be a situation where in certain types of breast cancer potentially you could use HRT is that is am I right in saying that yeah so you're right in saying like in in the past you, you know breast cancer was just seen as breast cancer and it was wasn't recognized as being a very nuanced when we say heterogeneous again, that's another medical jargony word to say that it's it's different. It can be it's you know no one breast cancer is the same. Just like um, everybody's menopause will be will be different. So again, it, you know, like a a, a low grade, um, let's say a, a, a pre invasive cancer like a DCIS, um, which doesn't have any hormone, which is not hormone sensitive, is a very different cancer to a very high grade kind of aggressive hormone sensitive invasive oh, cancer yeah um so i i guess the all the, the guidelines would still say to use non-hormonal um therapies first line for all the breast cancers even the hormone negatives and the pre-invasive cancers but it is recognized that they are different conditions and that if people are if non-hormonal options aren't working um, that under certain, you know, under certain circumstances, but an informed decision between your doctor and oncologist, um, if people are really struggling, then breast HRT is sometimes prescribed to to some women. Um, but you know, it is a it's, it is a careful, nuanced, informed discussion. Of course, yeah. of course yeah. absolutely. And moving away from um, breast cancer for a moment, what are the other? And I know it's a long list, but I suppose if you could give us the, you know, the top five or the top ten, um, other um situations where you know a, a a doctor would think, no, we we're not going to go down a HRT road here because again, everybody focuses so strongly on breast cancer, but I know that there are other conditions that are also yes. an issue in that regard. Yeah, so the vascular condi vascular conditions would be one of the the more common ones to come to mind, um, such as your heart attacks, your clots, your strokes, your PEs. And we see a huge proportion of those in, in the clinics um, across the country. And again, the, the, there are kind of historical concerns here, um, but it, there are also evidence-free zones in that, we, you know, we're lacking a little bit of data um to make us kind of fully relax but in in general i suppose the some of the concerns came to light again um after the studies that emerged in the early 2000s at the whi study and the million women study in the uk because prior to that everybody was on hrt you know in the 1990s and um but it, it emerged that the whi study that there was a small increased risk of let's say some vascular conditions like heart attacks and strokes and clots and there is that link with oral HRT, which everybody used to take in the past. OK, yeah. Um, um, but we now think that when you take estrogen via your skin in the form of a patch, a gel or a spray and enters your bloodstream directly via your skin. So it doesn't go into your stomach like when you're taking a tablet, um, you, you go, you know, it's metabolized directly by the liver, mm. um, which activates some of the clotting particles which can cause some of these conditions. Um, but by taking it via the skin, there's good evidence to show that it doesn't alter these parameters at all. So it's considered what we think is clot neutral. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, by, by taking low doses now and starting a kind of standard amounts via your skin, we don't think that it, that it, you're at, we're not, we don't think that we're increasing your risk of a, of a stroke or a clot or a heart okay. attack. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, in terms of women that already have established heart disease or already have, let's say, plaque in their arteries, um, what Karen probably alluded to in her chat is that we we there's a load of good quality studies showing that if you adhere to t and you reduce your risk of, of heart disease because menopause can increase that risk because estrogen could be protective to your vessels. Yeah. So, but it's slightly different to women that might have established heart disease because it's already there, if that makes sense. Right. Yes. So by giving someone HRT via the skin in that scenario, it's not going to be beneficial to them. It's not going to reduce their risk. But what we think is that it won't harm them. It won't make it worse, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, in the low to standard doses. But we um, we would like a little bit more evidence, I suppose, or studies looking at the newer types that we're using just to kind of confirm that in a little bit more detail. So again, again, it's a kind of a case case by case basis. And um, I guess the, the joy of the complex clinics is that we've got time to discuss all these things with people. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So so if I fall into a complex menopause category, what mm -hmm. and, and bearing in mind again mm -hmm. that it's very much individualized care, yeah. and, you know, a, a drop down list of whatever you're having yourself. But generally speaking, what are my treatment options, Brenda? Yeah, so I guess we um there'll always be the focus on, on lifestyle, um, which is which is important. And again, it boils back down to why you're presenting. Um, is 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 he, you know, are you presenting because you would just like to discuss options? Are you presenting because you're really, really struggling? Um, do you have a condition whereby we really, really are concerned about giving you, you know, HRT where there's a really an active contraindication? We would always advocate for for lifestyle choices or spend time discussing lifestyle because it really is important even for women that take HRT it's still really important to have yeah. the kind of lifestyle blocks in place the diet exercise the mind yes. making sure you, you know you've got um I, I guess um ways of of keeping your mind healthy you know yeah. um and just trying to be healthy in, in general we discuss things like where the, there's an evidence base a strong evidence base for psychological therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy in particular has really yeah. been shown to to benefit uh, menopausal symptoms um there's now kind of apps like the sleepio app which is directed for cbt for sleep and that has been proven and shown to help with sleep in 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 women um, with perimenopausal symptoms and menopausal symptoms so there's a definite evidence base for psychological therapies and we, we explore that Psychological therapies is all you know. It's a slow, so it, you know it's important. People, it won't be instant, but it's worthwhile investing in it because over time it can be just as effective as HRT for some women in, in certain conditions. Yeah. Um, complementary therapies are always a little bit topical. We don't have a huge evidence base for complementary therapies. Um, however, I, I guess the, there there was a study. Uh, on last year, 2022, by Frazoa in that was published in one of the oncology studies, which was looking at complementary therapies and um, breast cancer patients in particular, which we can extrapolate to some of the other conditions. And um, ac you know, acupuncture seems to help some women in terms of their their general well being. Yeah. Um, uh, hypnosis actually, there's a evidence base for for hypnosis in in yeah. in, in helping menopausal symptoms. Um, so, and there's other, I suppose, well being things that we might not have an evidence base for but that might some individual women might they, it might make an in might help one individual person do you know what I mean yes. so we yeah, discuss yeah. some of those and and then there's uh, what we call in again our medical jargon non-hormonal prescribed therapies um whereby we have prescribed medications which are licensed for other conditions so they were they've been used for a stay for and conditions like let's say anxiety depression migraine prophylaxis epilepsy actually but when people were studying um studying these these medications women were coming back and saying oh you know my hot flushes have actually been are much better oh you know. kind of almost by mistake they weren't expecting those results exactly it was kind yeah. of like a secondary result um so we and so we we use these as well, and they can be actually quite effective in in some women. They're That's second line really option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think people always think it's kind of, and again, um, I'm talking on behalf of people here. God bless me. You know, is that it's HRT or no HRT? Yeah. But actual, actually, some of the symptoms of menopause can be treated with non hormonal. It, exactly. 
yeah, yeah. and you know they, they we use much smaller doses than what we would be typically prescribing for the other conditions yeah. and how we think that they work is that a lot of these medications work by kind of altering neurotransmission in areas of the brain such as the thermoregulatory center which causes you know which changes around the time of menopause for some women which causes the hot flushes and the night sweats and mood and, and sleep so it's probably via neurotransmitter effect how how that can help some women um and it's important to say as well i guess that you know hydro he, tea is the first line option for for most women in terms of efficacy but hydro tea doesn't work for everybody and sometimes the second line options can be very effective do, yeah. do, do you know what i mean so it's important it's amazing to, 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 to say know that. that because again you know, just speaking for myself, I had no idea of that. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm on HRT. I was always going to go on to HRT mm. and, you know, HRT has has transformed me, I have to say. Uh, thank yeah. God for it. And um, because I was uh, suffering some very difficult symptoms, which I've discussed about 25,000 times on the Internet before. So I won't go into it again. But I didn't realize, actually, or it's good for people to know that if HRT is an issue or if you just don't want to take HRT, HRT, yeah. that there are other medications that are available to manage your menopause symptoms. That's that's again, yeah, that's kind absolutely. of a headline. That's kind of a headline that I think most people aren't really aware of, Brenda. So that's really helpful. To absolutely. Know. Yeah. yeah. And there's lots, of, there's lots of different types, Sinead, actually, you know, um, there's, 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 there's different types of the non-hormonal prescribed options. And you know, again, it's like that individuality, one option might suit and then you try a different option yeah. that might suit. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think yeah. it's worth making the point as well, Brenda, that, um, you know, HRT, um, even if you're lucky enough to be able to take it, is not an overnight sensation. I'm always saying this, you know, you don't start taking it on a Wednesday and by Friday you're feeling on top of the world. I mean, for me personally, I would say my HRT journey took so quite some time yeah. to reach, if you like, the, the the kind of the perfect solution for me but yes. I will say this to anyone who's listening when if you are in a position where you can take it um hang in there because it's it totally it is totally transformative but again for those of us who can't take it it's wonderful not to know that there are actually medications that are out there that can yeah. potentially be taken obviously discussed with your doctor um, yes. to control symptoms that's really good news and there's there's other options on, on the horizon as well. Um, they're called NK3 antagonists, which are in trial. They've just come. Um, they're they they are, I think they're actually in use in, in the USA actually. Yeah. And they um we have great hopes for these medications in terms of helping with hot flushes and night sweats and possibly even other menopausal symptoms. We need a little bit more research it on seems, the other one first. Absolutely, it seems, Brenda, that you know the. It seems again to me as a as a, a, a let's call me a civilian for the sake of this conversation. It seems that the technology is really kind of ramping up now, isn't it? In terms of yes, um, around female healthcare and particularly in the area of menopause, which is such good news. Uh, it absolutely is, and actually, that you know, I know that T Tanya from Fem from, from Fentech is going I to know. be speaking in the yes, day, and the, you know, there's huge innovation in terms of the tech, uh, you know, tech industry as well in terms of what's happening in the perimenopause and menopause space. And I know that what it was just discussing um, with one lady recently in relation to her project, you know, which is about a kind of a kind of a stellate ganglion block, a little block which can potentially help with hot flushes and night sweats. And there's loads of really good things coming down the tracks I think in Ireland which is fantastic. No it's it's exciting God only knows what will be available to women let's say in the next 20 years I mean it's it's really really exciting and as you say we're delighted to have Tanya who's at the the coal face of that whole femtech movement in Ireland so it's brilliant. Um, I think I have kind of asked you everything that I, I wanted to ask you Brenda but is there anything that you would like to add and you're under no pressure to do so um, and we were we were actually having a laugh you and I previously before trying to think about and I, I do understand that it's a struggle to cover complex menopause in a 20 minute talk <laughs> so, <laughs> it's quite a big area so it is it, it it is a struggle to do that so it's great to have the opportunity I suppose where we're not under pressure here and have that chat today but is there yeah. Anything else that you would like to add before we sign off? No, um, I I think we've covered the majority of things. I I when we got into that technical uh, difficulty there, I think I didn't answer one of your questions entirely, okay. which was about cancers. You know, before I guess following the studies, there was a concern about everybody taking HRT, but for a lot of people after certain cancers, it's actually recommended that you do take your HRT. So. 
you know, things like vaginal cancer, vulva cancer, um, colon cancer, bowel cancer. So just because someone has had cancer does not immediately outrule heat your teeth for 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 someone, you know. Um, yeah. And just to, I suppose, reiterate the fact that this list also isn't exhaustive either, you know. So if you feel that your case is complex, it's worth exploring that with your GP. You can discuss it with one of the clinics. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Well, I think some really, really great information there, Brenda, that I would wager a lot of people weren't aware of. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Anyway, guys. Um, so again, Brent, thank you so much for your time. So super to chat to you this evening. Um, yeah. And I hope everybody found that. I'm sure they did. Um, a, a, incredibly useful and informative. And uh, we'll be back again soon um, for the next of our um, menopause supports uh, with Marks and Spencer, where I will be talking to Katie Ridge. And Katie is a barrister at law and uh, works for Adair HRM and is an absolute expert in terms of the whole um, introduction of menopause supports into HR policies. She's had many years working in the Labour Court. She's worked in the um in the um yeah down in the Labour Court. I can't I'm sorry menopause brain can't think of the Workplace Relations Commission. That's it. The WRC. There you go. Menno brain. So I'll be talking to Katie next time. On that note I will sign off. Um uh, thanks again uh, Brenda for your time today. Um and I hope everybody has a great day. It's lash and rain where I am. I know it's lash and where Brenda is, but maybe it won't be raining when this goes out. Who knows? All right, guys. Thank you so much for that. See you again soon.